Thank you. Again, my name is Carrie Lorino. I'm the founder of the Google Veterans Network. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight with, um, with Sebastian Younger, with Guillermo Trevera, and Brandon O'Byrne, um, who we just saw in this incredible film, The Last Patrol. Um, again, wonderful to be here with all of you, friends from Iraq and Afghanistan, Veterans of America, Student Veterans of America, Team Rubicon, Team Red, White, and Blue, Veterans Advantage, and the US Military Academy at West Point, as well as many Googlers as well who are, who are in this audience. Um, uh, it was an incredible film. Sebastian, I've seen all three of, of your films. And um, it's, you know, the, when I watched Restrepo and we screened it on this very stage, um, you, for those of us who hadn't served in the military, we were able to experience what it meant to go to war. Korangal gives you a feeling of why it's so hard to leave that behind. And now with The Last Patrol, you're giving us an opportunity to see what it feels like to come home um, and reconnect with America. And um, I want to thank you for letting us come on this journey with you of your own transition. Um, and it's very clear uh, to all of us in this room and, and those watching that the transition process for those leaving combat and combat reporting or combat um, in general is a very difficult one. Um, that people have great expectations when they come home and sometimes um, those expectations aren't met. Um, I have to say my favorite character was Daisy. <laughs> Far and away, no offense to you guys. You know, at Google, um, you're allowed to bring your dog to work every day, and we thought last night about inviting Daisy, and um, that would have been fun. Maybe we'll do that another time, but um, she did a great job. Um, she was loved her camera, camera work. What'd you say? She's our best camera woman. I was just gonna say, she was an excellent camera woman. She did fantastic. She's getting more work than I am right now, actually. <laughs> yes. So um, I took away some really big themes from all of this. Um, combat. America, um, fathers, the influence and the impact of your relationships uh, with them, addiction of different kinds, manhood. Um, there's some really, really big, powerful themes that, that stood out for me. And you, you forgot how to cook in your car engine. That's right. I want that, I want that cookbook. It's called Manifold Destiny. Man <laughs> it is, no, it's not a joke. It is called Manifold Destiny. Really? I tracked it down, yeah. I, will you so it was a classic from the 70s. I, Oh my gosh. I feel like we should get everybody in this audience a copy of that. Um, Imagine the sales. I mean, like, you just haven't been sold for years, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> 200 copies get sold off the. You can get them on Amazon, seriously. Okay. For real. Manifold Destiny. Manifold Destiny. Okay. Um, so, of all of those themes, and there are many others that I didn't mention, um, I want to talk about purpose and what your purpose was in doing this. and. Um, Clearly, you know, you had a goal to reconnect with America um, and to decompress after war, but why did you really do this? It's such an interesting idea. I mean, originally, when I first had the idea, I was going to do it with Tim, and it was going to be a way to sort of show Tim America and for me to understand America in a new way. I mean, if you, if you make yourself vulnerable and marginal, you have a very different relationship with the place than if you're just driving through it. And uh, you're very marginal and vulnerable if you don't have a place to sleep at night. I mean, really, if you want to experience being marginal, just walk out your front door and don't come back at night. Spend one night out. Find a place to curl up and come back in the morning. And you, you'll, you'll experience what it is to be a vulnerable person in this society. And you'll feel vul vulnerable no, how, no matter how much you have in your bank account. You just do that, you'll get it. And so I wanted to experience America a little bit like that, and I thought the railroad lines would provide us this sort of view from the inside out in America. You know, highways go around towns or whatever. Railroad line goes right straight through the middle. So that was originally what I wanted to do, and then Tim died. And so I had this whole thing that I was struggling with, and I got, uh, I got to know Guillermo uh, because of Tim's death, and we're, you know, great friends really, really close, but I wouldn't have met him, you know, otherwise, I don't think. And Brendan and Dave, I, I knew, Tim and I knew from Afghanistan. I just thought, okay, here's four guys who've been in a lot of combat. We're not going to go back to war again. And maybe we could also have this long conversation. It just seemed like a way to, my life needed, I needed to change. I was 50 years old. A lot had happened in my life in the previous few years. 
I really needed a change. And I just thought if I put myself in an extreme place, but with people that I really trusted and was connected to, like that's how you change. Mm -hmm. And Guillermo, why did you agree to go? Well, uh, at the beginning when we were walking, I used to say, Sebastian, I don't see the story. I don't see, I don't understand why we have to do this. <laughs> I was very tired every day. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like to sleep outside. Indeed. So I kept going. We know what you think of the army ponchos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most understand. army Is that products. Is true? Yeah. Yes. They are very bad. They are supposed to be impermeable, yeah. but they are not. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah, and, and when we kept going and going, I was just going because it was a great. Um, opportunity for me to be and photograph America and be in the movie. So I kept on going, but I kept on saying, Sebastian, I don't, I don't see the story. But after, after a while, I start to see. And the sea was something more than being there photographing and in the project. It was more about my inside, what I was uh, experiencing, uh, dealing with three guys. I didn't know them. And they have kind of the same problem that I had. And that's what made me more touched with the film. And after all, I learned a lot. Yeah. yeah. And Brendan, it sounds like you liked it so much that it was hard for you to leave. Yeah. <laughs> I like, um, you know, I was going through a really rough time in my life also. I was, you know, um, it was the really me breaking up with my wife was the, the starts of that. and. Um, I was in bad in drinking. I was drinking a lot, and uh, all those things. It was really nice to get away from all that. Even I, I, I couldn't, when staying at my house, I couldn't stop myself from drinking. But being in the middle of the woods, I, I couldn't get booze. So that was like my way, sure way of not drinking for a week. And uh, that's what I did. And and also, I, my my wife wasn't there, so <laughs> so that's why I really loved it. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't actually about about uh, combat. No, I, I wasn't trying all. to heal. Different kind of combat. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> so on this journey, it seemed like you all met um, some really interesting characters, and um, really like a slice of America that most of us don't see all of the time. And um, I I wonder what it felt like to see that, especially for Brennan after being in combat and coming home, and the people on whose behalf you served seeing them, hearing what they had to say about America. Um, what, are the, what was that experience like? Uh, Meeting people who are so disconnected from the experience that you went through, right, in the war. Yeah, I mean, the um, well, meeting America was great for me because it really showed me what I, was, um, I fought for, really. Um, and uh, it's really sad to see what state our country's actually in. There's a lot of upset, a lot of... Um, a lot of poverty, a lot of drug abuse, a lot of alcoholism, and um, it was sort of sobering to to, to see that the, the the place I was fighting for is doing really poorly in some places. So it was really good to get to see that and say, "All right, well, the, now there's a battle here at home also that I can fight." And um, you know, the disconnect is going to happen no matter what because there's only one percent of our country that's fighting for um, in the ar in the military. So I understood that that disconnect was going to happen, uh, but so that didn't bother me as much as as it really bothered me that to see how many people were living in poverty and living actually probably worse off than I was in Afghanistan. I mean, in, in many ways. And <clears throat> what really surprised me was the fact that um, when we were walking through the bad parts, you know, quote unquote, the bad parts of the of towns, was where we actually got the most help. It was where we got the most support from people. It wasn't in richer, upper class areas. They didn't want to help us. But the, the people that were low on the totem pole, the, the people that were really just trying to survive, they wanted to help us. And that, said a lot, that says a lot to me about um, community. You know, community is still alive in those small groups, in, the, in those places of poverty. And, um, and it's not alive in places like upper class, middle class areas. It's just not alive there. And that, that surprised me, because that's what I thought, I thought it was going to be the opposite. 
That's, and Guillermo, I'm really curious to hear your opinions about that. You're originally from Spain, and you've lived here off and on for many years, and you've been around the globe a few times. Um, from the perspective of someone who isn't American, having the chance to walk the railways with two Americans or three Americans and seeing what you saw, um, it seemed like there was an equal amount of pride that these, these, these folks felt as well as a great degree of sadness that came through. And I'm you know, curious as, as someone who isn't American what your impression was about the state of our country. Well, uh, America is just uh, fascinate me because it has a lot of weird things, and I like them to photograph. But also um, rejects me, like in the way like I see a lot of uh, people in same, and a lot of problems that we don't see when we are in Europe looking at the movies from America. And uh, I, I had that feeling like the people is really. Um, when you walk around, you see a lot of pain, a lot of pain in the faces. And that happens everywhere. Every, every, everywhere you see that problem, because it's a human problem. And happens, I see it in Afghanistan, everywhere. But the difference I feel is like in other countries, people help each other more. And here you see a lot of individuality and a lot of loneliness. And that makes the problem bigger. And that's my feeling. Was that something you've seen before, or this trip brought that to life for you? Well, I saw it before when I came here when I was in college. I came two or three years for studying. And I live upstate in New York, in Troy. And there's a lot of people in same there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm writing an article about um, PTSD right now for Vanity Fair. And they did. I just heard about this. They had a really, I had this sort of idea that um, one of the things that's hard for combat vets to come back to, to come back to is the sort of alienation of society. I mean, if you're in a platoon in combat, you're never further away than a few feet from another person for a year. I mean, you're very, very close, intense human experience. And then you come back to this society, and you know, you're, you're it's much more spread out and and often alone, right? So I thought maybe the problem with combat trauma isn't the combat trauma, it's that people are trying to heal by themselves. And so you have individual therapy and you know, whatever. And there's the community experience is lacking here. Like, so I've been talking to people about that and they did an experiment with uh, lab mice. And you can traumatize a lab mouse and give it traumatic stress, right? You can give it PTSD just like humans. and those symptoms, those symptoms of trauma, you can keep those going indefinitely if you keep startling the mouse, right? You know, loud noises, whatever. You can keep those symptoms going after the trauma. But if you put that, only if the mouse is by itself, and if you put that mouse back in a community of mice, no matter what you do, you cannot keep those trauma symptoms at the same level. They decline. And I think, you know, when you talk about People being in pain in this country and, and 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 alone, like I think that I think he's really right. I think there's a lot of pain here, and it comes from a sort of basic um, loneliness that a lot of people feel in suburban. I grew up in a suburb, the loneliest place in the world. I think uh, so. I can't wait to read it. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting, some of the veteran service organizations that we partner with here at Google, like a Team Rubicon or a Team Red, White, and Blue, um, those organizations get people out into the field. And I believe there was an article written recently on task and purpose um, about um, how being downrange together, having that camaraderie is something that these, these organizations are trying to foster for, for veterans who are, who are coming back from these two wars. And um, it seems very similar to the environment that you were replicating on this patrol. Um, so that's interesting. Um, what specifically, looking back on it now, was similar about the patrol and war? Um, there were a couple things that stood out to me. I remember at one point in the film, they, um, you were looking out, and maybe through binoculars, you were looking out for cops who were 
far away, and it was almost like they were the enemy in this situation, and we were trying to... S almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't the enemy, but they were definitely a but challenge. But it just, you know, yeah. I remember watching Restrepo and thinking, oh, this is like, yeah. you're looking way out for the Taliban, where are these guys, and you're doing the same thing, you're taking cover from trains that are going by, you're taking cover from bullets, and, you know, it, it felt like similar without the lens of combat there. What, what for you guys, was most similar about the experience? I didn't find any similarity. No. The only thing I felt is like, uh, as I told you before, like after a few trips in the patrol, I felt like coming back to see these guys and to spend more time with them because I felt good. And that's kind of the feeling you go, when you go to a war and you go, are with friends, journalists in my case, you feel good because you help each other and you are in that kind of situation. For me, what that was the, the similarity. Maybe for them it was something different. Yeah, for me, it's um, it was the idea that you know, um, in in society, like Sebastian was saying, you know, it's a group of eyes. Everyone is I, me. You know, inside combat, I only used I and me uh, was when I fucked up. You know, when it was my fault. And I, it, hey, my bad. That was my fault. And the rest of the time, we, we used we because that was what we were. And inside of the patrol, we had to um, we had to do the same thing. We had to leave the I at home, and use the 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 we. And it, you could see it in one of the times. Uh, you know, Guillermo was having a hard time walking, and it was, it was really hot. And Sebastian took his pack. I mean, those are the things that you you know without even qu actually demanded to give you know give me your pack. And you're like, eh, but it's you know. So those are the things that you don't see in society. You don't see those. Um, you know, I, I think there was a. There was a homeless person, or, or there was someone, I think, dead in the street. I, I can't remember the exact story in New York City. And there was like a few hundred people that passed by him and didn't even help him. Didn't, they didn't know he was dead or, or dying. And that, that, that says a lot. I mean, that's lonely. I mean, when people are walking past you and you're dying and they don't help you, let, you know, in, in combat, that, that doesn't happen. So it was, the similarities were that we were all there and we were all supporting each other in, in every way. And we got shot at one time, which was sort of similar, but <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't very accurate. So <laughs> um, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who have questions. We have some mics out in the audience. Um, it would be great if anybody has a question, um, if we could bring a mic over to those folks so that we their uh, questions are audible. Hi. Um, well, I have a question about audience. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've seen Restrepo. I haven't seen Korangal, but but Restrepo seemed like a, a film that was designed to educate, to a great extent, educate the 99% to see what that's really like. Here, though, you, uh, the reason I ask this is because uh, one of the significant challenges a veteran deals with when he comes home is that trust situation, the ability to trust someone who hasn't been there with them. And I happen to work a lot with veterans and experience that. And yet, and yet. While this is still educational for civilians, there seems to be another. Uh, I, I'm wondering how important the the military, the veteran audience, is because, you know, on the one hand, uh, soldiers these may be soldiers that are like that that don't want to talk to anyone. But yet, although you've been shot at quite a bit and lost one of your best friends, you know, you were a civilian, as are you as well, Guillermo. And and there are many stories filtering through the film that are all about other child, you know, childhood traumas. The dog, you know, getting killed. Your example of the mice, you know, trauma in many cases feels the same. And I wonder if how intentional and how important the audience of a veteran is for you in the sense that they can come back and, and, and relate to people that in that way, that you know, in, in terms of uh, empathy and, and uh, the universality or of post-traumatic stress. And I wonder if that's a helpful starting point for a veteran. Yeah, I absolutely had veterans in mind making this film, not exclusively, um, but I absolutely had veterans in mind. Uh, I, I thought of it as an example of uh, collaboration and closeness, uh, but back home, and uh, like, see, you can do it here too, and and the consequences are almost certainly not fatal, uh, so that's a good thing. Um, but you do get a lot of the same closeness, and uh, so absolutely, I thought about veterans, but I, you know, in some ways, you know, I thought civilians can learn about veterans with this film. Uh, soldiers can learn about. Journalists. I'm a journalist. Guillermo's a journalist. Um, it's all men. I feel, I feel like women can watch this film and learn about something about men. You know, 
I learned a lot. Some Did you? Unfortunate yeah. truths about men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, you know, the sexes are bizarre and frustrating to each other. And here, there's four, you know, four men talking pretty openly uh, about everything, including about their feelings about women. You know, it just seemed like that might be interesting, and um, and it would allow, um, you know, and allow in some ways allow veterans to sort of learn about America. You know, we're among other things, we're walking through America. And it's a much, it's a much sort of weirder country than I quite realized. You know, like we all live in our communities, and we know those communities. But until you walk through other communities, you can drive through. I'm sorry, it's not the same. Like if you walk through, and you have to find a place to sleep that night, and you have to engage with people, you really get to know wherever you are. And um, that's, as Brendan was saying, you know, like the communities that were the most intimidating to me absolutely were the most welcoming. And the ones where we actually really had problems were the wealthy communities, like the kind of town I grew up in, actually. It was a really interesting experience. Other questions? Hey, uh, so Sebastian and Brendan, we kind of share a brother, um, Tanner Steester. I went to basic training with that guy. Uh, he's he's the forward observer that that you guys might know from uh, from his first movie, um, and really my question is, what's it like to be a journalist, a civilian, led into that circle, into that brotherhood? Because it's you know I, I say every day I'm I'm a student veteran leader and I tell people all the time I'm like, look, we're all brothers, we're all sisters. Once you serve in the military, it doesn't matter if you're in uniform, if you're out. If you deployed, if you didn't deploy, it doesn't matter. Once you raised your right hand to serve, you're my brother. And Sebastian, you know, we've never met before. But after seeing your, your films and knowing who you're connected with, I feel like you're part of that circle. You know, what's it like to, to get into that and, and to have that unique perspective as far as a civilian goes? Well, you know, I, I thank you, first of all. Um, I, th I think in any group, the amount that you're allowed in is connected to the amount that you're willing to give, right? And, and if you're, you're in a group that you don't know very well, you're not really part of it, and you're probably not willing to give very much of yourself up for it, right? But as you get close to people, as you learn to connect to them, you love them, you're worried about them, you know, whatever, the amount of yourself that you're giving out rises, and... Likewise, in the other direction, that connection rises also. And so by the end of the deployment that I covered with Tim, you know, uh, before the end, but, you know, as it went by, I felt completely part of that platoon, you know? And, um, and I, think, I think they thought of me that way too. And, um, and one of the things that I really liked about the patrol, the last patrol, was that we kind of did that with each other. And I think we all had to learn to think about the group more than about how we individually were feeling. So when I took Guillermo's pack, I mean, I was thinking, you know, I was sort of putting him ahead of me. And I know that in another circumstance, he would have done that for me. And once you're in that kind of relationship with a number of other people, um, you're kind of home free. That's, I think, where we all want to be. And I think in this society, it's hard to find uh, circumstances that, re that require that or even permit it. I I'd like to ask you, though, have you been uh, embedded with U.S. forces? Uh, in, in a yes, I was. I'd love to know what, as a, I mean, I I'm an American with American forces. As a foreigner with American forces, wh how did you feel, I mean, how did you feel with them? Or what, how did they think of you? I'm just curious. Like, what was your experience? I think it's... Um the beginning is hard because they don't know you yeah. and it's hard for them to trust you. But at the end, it's very similar than being embedded with the Afghans in this example. Right. At the end, all make a group, they accept you and they treat you really well and they protect you. Right, great. And it's just, I think it's more a matter of, of humanity. They, yeah. they take care of yeah. each other as a group. As yeah. The thing that happened with us in right. the patrol. Right. Yeah. Guillermo, did they did um, did they pull pranks on you also? 
because we 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 harassed Sebastian quite a bit out there, and that's when he we really told him that he was part of the group. Was what, you know we started pulling really bad pranks on him. He, we found out he was afraid of spiders, so it was just. Yeah. If you're ever embedded, don't tell them you're scared of spiders or anything, or, or scared of anything, anything for that matter, or, or your mother's name. Yeah, yeah, or your mother's name. Definitely not your sister's name. Like all just. Important information. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> Other questions this side of the room? Do we have mics over I here? You, I got oh. you right here. Okay. I actually have two questions. First question is, how's Dave? He's good. I think well, he's over. No, he's back. Oh, he's back. He's back he, now. Good. I, I can answer that real quickly. Just add to that. He went, you know, he went over with a private outfit, but working with the military. And then he finally came back again. I just sent him an email and said, hey, man, how you doing? What are you up to? He said... He just he just got a place in central Wisconsin, uh, way out in the way out in the woods, like 80 acres, and uh, and he said that he he's been splitting wood and hunting a lot, and uh, so like okay, you're probably good. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so second question, um, and this one kind of hits me both from Restrepo and from uh, the Last Patrol. Um, for me personally, in the same situation, and for a lot of folks that I know that. Um, my current my current position who haven't been in that same situation um, for me it's all about control um, when you're with your friends and you're with your brothers and your sisters um, you don't have to worry about yourself everybody somebody's got your back all the time somebody's telling you what to do you're telling somebody else what to do and it's kind of this big circle um, but as soon as you get back you kind of lose all that and you have to figure out how to have control of yourself again and um, what I find myself a lot is trying to find somebody to give to take control over me tell me what to do tell me where to go um, and it's this constant kind of inner struggle. I want to take control of myself, but also I kind of want that that same feeling, you know, where when times are tough, I want somebody to tell me what to do and where to go. Um, and I kind of that kind of got that same feeling from both movies. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's actually it's, it's strangely it's a really good feeling to be in a group where you you have a job where you're you're being given a job sometimes and told to do something, you know, because it means that a you're trusted, but be that you're also being taken care of, like Guillermo. When you, I mean, you were pro you probably, uh, I mean, I was with Brennan and Dave in Afghanistan in a platoon, but you, you know, your experience in war has been a little bit more independent, right? So the the patrol was probably a little different for you in terms of cooperating with some other people, oh, right? Yeah. So what was that trans? Did you resist the? You know, if I told you go do something, like, did you resist it at first? Like what? Was there a transition where you accepted that? Oh, yeah. yeah. At the beginning, I didn't want to help anyone. I noticed that. I I, actually. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I just wanted to take pictures. And uh, I didn't have that experience of being like protected. With When I travel around, I, I'm by myself. And no one protects me. It's kind of tricky. Yeah. So for me, being in the, pat in the patrol was completely different. I was protected by three guys. And I felt like nothing. I don't have anything to do. Just been here and take pictures. <laughs> was was great, but you know it was a great feeling because at the at the beginning I didn't want to get involved in the group, but after after a while I I learned how to to be involved with them. What what, cha what, what really changed? What I mean, what why why did why did it change? Like when did it change? How did that work? Because if I don't change, I had to keep fighting all the time with my brain. And that's why I had to change and, and just relax. How long did it take? It took a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, also, the, 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 one of the things I found is that um, when you're actually giving of, to a group, it feels really good. You know, I think that's what, like, Team Rubicon is where they at. You know, they, they, they do the same thing. They give to back to America, and it's just like, of course, that feels good. That feels really good. So finding something like that to give back to, even if it's not a, a group of um, close friends, if, if it, even if it's your country, that's going to make you feel really, um, really great. And I think that that's one of the things that saved me, because that's what I do. I try, to, I try to give back as much as I can to the veteran community, and that makes me feel better about being alone inside society. But I think it says a lot about about relations, even between men and women, that sometimes they are keep on fighting and don't relax because they want to keep control of their own lives. 
and not give the control right. to the other. Mm. And that's, I think that's a, a thing in the movie it shows a lot about relations. Brendan, I want to, um, I really want to applaud you for um, what you just said about giving back, because I think the most important leadership role that I've, I, you know, we don't know each other all that well, but I've, I feel like I know you because you're a movie star. Um, I've never been in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I want to applaud you for being so open about sharing your story and your experiences having served in the military. The only way that people like us who care about veterans at Google and other companies are able to do our jobs is because there are people like you who are willing to tell your story. And um, you're a really expressive, soulful guy. And um, it makes all the difference in setting a leadership example for other veterans to be able to follow in your footsteps and, and um, and share so that the rest of us can learn and we can heal as a community. Um, service members go home to communities, communities that want to embrace them and don't know how. And um, it's not easy as a civilian to go up to someone and say, thank you for your service. And I know you in particular don't particularly like that phrase. Um, but it's not easy for anybody, right? And um, the work that you're doing is, is helping all of us. So I, I think we need to all applaud this guy for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I, I think that, I think that um, when I talk about my service, I talk about we're, you know, service members, we, we join the military to serve our country, right? So when we, when we go to war and when we go to combat and, and the things that we see and we, when we do there, they're not ours. They're not ours. They're, they're our countries. So I, I really, I think that this is the only way to come home is to share these stories because it, it, it's our country's stories. It's not our stories. So these, you know, for veterans that, that are, oh, you, you can't hear my story because you won't understand. Of course they're not gonna understand. They're not gonna understand until we speak up and talk about this stuff. And once we start speaking up and talking about this stuff, it's, you know, there's, our country is growing uh, in two parts. It's uh, civilians and, and veterans. And if we don't bridge that gap, if we don't somehow bridge that gap, 22 veterans a day kill themselves. Why do you think that is? You know, we have to bridge that gap. And the only way to bridge that gap is to be telling our stories and telling our stories accurately, not some, and, and not patting ourselves on the back like these Navy SEALs do. <laughs> <laughs> but, just, but just honestly, you know, what we actually experienced, what we actually saw, the things that we experience over there is, is going to help. If we start talking to these about to civilians about these things, it's going to help the civilians, and it's definitely going to help us. So that's what I, I, I put that out to every veteran here and everyone that's going to serve in the military. Tell your damn story. It's not yours. It's not yours. So open up. Awesome. We have a question over here. Um, my first question is for Sebastian. Did you remember to brush your teeth today? <laughs> <laughs> it's Vietnam. Uh, I did, actually, yeah. <laughs> special, special event, so. <laughs> um, my real question. Uh, it's mentioned in the documentary that veterans who come home from war uh, that have personal issues typically had those personal issues prior to going to war. Do you think it's those personal issues that draw them to war in, to begin with? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I know, I mean, this has been studied, obviously, like the, uh, it's not an absolute correlation, but there's some, like one of the indicators of uh, combat trauma after combat is if you've had personal trauma in your life before combat. And, and, and there's, there's some, some, connection, some connection, which is really important to understand. Like the Israeli military has a PTSD rate of 1%. And one of the reasons, and there's a number of reasons, I think it's a more cohesive community. Everyone serves. Everybody serves. Uh, you don't come back and feel like an alien. You're coming back to a society that understands what you went through because everyone is involved in the military to some degree. I think it helps a lot. But also they screen. They screen for uh, uh, vulnerability to combat trauma. And they keep people who are vulnerable because of prior trauma, they keep them out of those units. It's really, really smart. So and. So yeah, I, you know, I think there's a, I think that actually it's an important issue, um, and 
your first question actually made me think of a quick story. Uh, at one point, we'd been on the road for a good week. As you, you know, you saw we you know, got pretty, we got pretty dirty pretty quickly out there. And um, after like a week, we were along the Juniata River. Uh, it was right before the last 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 scene in the film, and uh, it was a nice warm April day, and. Uh, and I thought, oh, you know, we, none of us has touched a drop of water for a whole week. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe let's bathe, you know, before we end this trip. And I said, uh, hey, I think I'm going to, you know, jump in the river, soak down, rinse off, feel good. And uh, I said, um, who's got soap? <laughs> and we all, we looked around, four guys, right? We all know we're going to be out there for a good week in the woods. Not one of us even thought to bring soap. And, and that didn't actually, didn't correct the problem later. Yeah, yeah the next trip, no the one last, brought soap either. We didn't yeah, right. No. <laughs> Other questions? Hey guys, thanks for doing this. Uh, so I wanted to ask actually about the folks that you met along the way. Uh, it seemed to me that for the first half of the movie you were asking folks, What's dividing us? Or, you know, what's what's wrong with with the American identity right now? And then and then somewhere along the way it switched to to, to what what do you love about America? W why those questions? And and more so, how do those questions connect to the veterans' uh, identity and the veterans' narrative that you're trying to to punch through here? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I, I what I was thinking is that when I was with those guys in the Korangal, they do something called movement to contact. And they'd sort of walk down valley in a patrol, and they basically contact would mean talking to people who were willing to talk to them in the villages, or occasionally contact meant uh, kinetic, you know, firefight, right? And but when they were able to talk to people, basically they'd say, "How are, how are things? How are you doing? What do you you know? What's going on? Do you need anything? You know, whatever that kind of assessment of the needs of civilians in a very very poor place. It was a smart thing to do. Hearts and minds, right? It was a smart idea." And I don't know if they got honest answers or not, but it was, you know, it was a good idea. So I, I just thought, okay, the country's coming out of two wars. Someone should do a movement to contact in this country and ask people, like, how are you doing? What do you need? What are you worried about? The same kind of thing, but in this country. The problem with that, it was a good idea, uh, but the problem with it is that I found that the answers wound up being um, basically sound bites that I'd heard in the media. You know, we're turning into a socialist country or, you know, we've gone, we drifted too far away from God or whatever. I'm like, I, like that's just not a helpful analysis of where we're at as a nation. Like, you've, you, and, and furthermore, you're upset, but you're not thinking with your own brain. Like, you're, you're borrowing someone else's ideas and just repeating them. You're not really thinking. I'm asking you a real question and you're using someone else's you know, some pundit on TV, you're using their ideas. And uh, so it just wa it wasn't interesting, you know? And so I started, I thought maybe if I asked what's the best thing about this country, no one goes on, t on TV to talk about what the best thing in this country is, right? Like, so they won't, there aren't any sound bites for that, so. Apparently you can Google it, though. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. And, That's my favorite answer. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, and, and so we started to get something that was a little more interesting. Um, there was one guy, it was, there were amazing people that didn't make it into the film. And, you know, it's the heartbreak of making documentaries is, you know, you just, stuff gets left out that is just beautiful. And we, in Baltimore, we ran into a guy, a uh, young African-American guy, uh, actually a young African guy, uh, who was now American, and he'd grown up in Liberia. And I was in Liberia during the Civil War. And one of the things that, that stopped that civil war was the arrival of American forces in Monrovia uh, and, and also other African forces in Monrovia to um, enforce a, a peace between the rebels and the government. And he was just, you know, he was just a kid when that happened, right? It was like 11 years ago, so he was, you know, he's a young, young boy. And um, so he had, he had this memory of, that America had actually come to his country and done something really, really good. They didn't fire a shot, by the way. and and. So he had a very positive idea of America, but then he came here, and he was not only experiencing, he was glad to be here, but he was, he was very, very poor, and he was an immigrant. 
And he was very upset at the attitude that he was encountering about immigrants. He's like, look, you came to Liberia to help my country. Now here I am, I'm trying to get an education to do good in the world, and I'm an immigrant and you don't like me. Like what, uh, that doesn't make sense. And um, he had just said this very powerful thing. He was like, look, we're all immigrants. Like, except for the American Indians, like we're, all of us are immigrants. So it's a whole country of immigrants. So who's, who is it to stand up and say that one group's immigrants, and, but we're not? Like, it's stupid. And he, you know, so there were people that were very, very upset about things. And he was one of the few who really didn't, was not using sound bites. He was really using his brain. And it was an incredible, an incredible moment. You remember that, you remember that guy, right? Yeah, so anyway, long answer, but. Yeah, but when they ask, you ask what the best thing about America, I'll say freedom of speech, of freedom. Yeah. And I really don't have that sense of America. When you travel around, you see what's freedom. You know, here it's freedom, but a different freedom. Right. Well, there's economic freedom. Right, and, and political freedom. And I think we are very, very free in this country to say what we feel, yeah. what we think, absolutely. You can stand on a street corner and scream that you hate the president, and most of the countries in the world, you'll be get, you know, you get put in prison for that. You know, but not here, it's amazing. Um, but we don't, I know a lot of people who grew up in the Eastern Bloc, right? You know, it's those societies, as flawed as they are in terms of political freedom, economically, people are way more equal. I mean, the gap between rich and poor is, is not large, it's small. And, um, and so that, you know, like do we have economic freedom here? I mean, a lot of us do, but a lot of us do not. And that, that is not, was not true of the Eastern Bloc, as poor as it was. Hi, I, uh, Brandon, I noticed uh, in a scene in the movie, uh, you had an EOD t-shirt on. That was a, uh, I, I didn't have any clean shirts. Uh, <laughs> uh, D Dave lent it to me, so mm -hmm. you gotta talk to Dave about The next that. round's on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this isn't a question, but more of a comment. Um, I honestly, from the bottom of my heart and behalf of my family and my wife, thank you for making this. Thank you for making the films that you've made. Um, not from an entertainment aspect, but more as perspective. Um, there are those of us that have experienced certain things um, that we might not have the words to talk about. You mentioned, Brendan, that this isn't our story. You're absolutely right. These are stories that people here need to know. People that watch this movie need to know. But we don't have the words and sometimes we don't have the capabilities. We're going through our own things, myself included. These films offer a glimpse into our own minds and something that I may not be able to tell my wife that I'm going through, but she can watch this movie. And there were certain times during the portion of this movie that she's sitting there shaking her head. You know, she, I think there were a couple times where it really clicked with her. Same thing with Restrepo. And I can't thank you enough for that. Um, it really means a lot to a lot of people that you can do this. And we talked about bridging the gap. You're doing it. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Real, real fast, you know, um, when, when Sebastian uh, wrote the book, one of the things I, f I first said to him, was that um, you're explaining us to us. Thank you. And that's what I told him. And it was one of the first times that I was being explained to me. And that's what really helped me get to where I am right now and being able to speak about this because he's helped me along this way and, and to, to tell me, like, dude, you're messed up because of this or you're messed up or, or not messed up. He never said that, but he's, you know. He yeah, yeah, he implied it for sure. <laughs> yeah. To get your life together. I'm like, why? I'm like, life is going great. <laughs> but yeah, he, he's he's explained a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of us. He, he has led the path in this, and I really, it's you know, thank you from from this side too. And I want to also thank you, uh, Rudy, who was there, the cameraman. Yeah. We no, we don't see him in the movie, but at the beginning, I was 
all the time telling him, I hate this, I hate this. <laughs> you know. You were complaining was, to the cameraman? Yeah, yeah. Really? Is that? Uh, he was really supporting me. <laughs> did, did, he, did he hate it too? Did, yes. Yeah, he did, right? Yeah. <laughs> But the the guys paid. who carried he the least weight paid. hated it the most. That's weird. <laughs> weird. I know. I know. <laughs> a couple other questions. Now, just real quick, as far as being non-combatants in that role and being combatants in that role, despite being on American soil and being relatively safe, like a knee-jerk reaction, whether it be in the middle of the night or something like that, did you find yourself like, like? wishing you almost had a weapon on you to feel more comfortable or wishing that your combatant had a weapon on you just again just whether it be a train going by or seeing the helicopters or in a situation like that yeah we had we had um it, we really did get shot at once and um we were in the middle of pennsylvania and <clears throat> it was a, it was actually outstanding because <laughs> <laughs> that sounded weird <laughs> it's not that weird uh, but we um all right so we had bear mace uh, which is like, like, you can't, you know, bears get stopped by that, grizzlies. So, uh, crackheads definitely get stopped by it. <laughs> and uh, and we also had a machete. So, and we had a dog. So some of the, the the close range stuff we weren't really too concerned about, you know. But um, when we got shot at, it was the funniest thing. We were be below this, um, well, we were underneath a bridge. <laughs> That's how normally you get shot at. Yeah, you, you know, you start out with being underneath a bridge. <laughs> And um, and we so we hear t these two shots. So Sebastian grabs the machete and runs off, and uh, and and I run uh, going around the hill to to flank this guy, and I'm up right up the wall trying to see where they're shooting at us from. It was just the weirdest thing because I really did want a gun at that point, but uh, I'm glad I didn't. It would have been a weird situation uh, that Sebastian got into a firefight in the middle of Pennsylvania. That would. <laughs> The news wouldn't have, I don't think, would have liked that. But it was it's a, this reaction immediately. Didn't even think about it. We didn't talk about it. He ran this one way. I went up this way. And we were about to assault whatever the, the person was up there. And uh, yeah, but it, it felt very vulnerable at that moment because we didn't have weapons. And, um, but we were going to handle whatever we were going to handle. Yeah, I mean, we both immediately thought, I mean, I thought we, we need to do, we, we didn't communicate either. It was instantaneous. But I, I thought we got to do the thing that this guy least expects us to do. And for Brendan, that meant climbing this rock wall, it's about 15 feet high, and peeking over the edge of it. Uh, and for me, it meant grabbing the machete and trying to run around so I could get behind him and um, sort of deal with him that way. And it was instantaneous, but it, it really, what motivated me, and I think Brendan, was just this. I was absolutely indignant that someone would try to harm these guys, you know? And it was such an instant, instantaneous reaction. And um, it, I don't know, it was the only moment, I think, on the patrol that I felt a little Afghan or something. Yeah. Right? It's cool. It was cool. <laughs> we, the footage wasn't good enough to put it in the film, so we had to leave it as a story, yeah? No, no, he stopped shooting. He just fired a few rounds. And it was the Amish Mafia, definitely. It was the Amish <laughs> yeah. Mafia. Yeah. They got us. Yes, go ahead. Front row. Ma'am. Oh, yes. Um, you talked a lot about the relationship you had with your father or, and your, your, your wives, right, and women. I'm sorry. You talked about the relationships you had with your fathers that came up, but I never heard you say anything about your mothers. Did you discuss the relationship you had with your mothers, and did you edit that out, or was it just something that never really was important enough to have? I know this is going to sound weird, because we walked 350 miles together, but I don't think any of us ever mentioned either the marriages we were in or our mothers. I don't know why. Did we? Did we talk about the relationship? Only, only when I was, we were asked, like, what, what does your wife do for you? And I'm like, yeah, she keeps me in line. That was the only time that. No, I, the question there was, what do you like best about women? Is actually what the yeah. question oh. was. <laughs> yeah. So that was, yeah, right. that was the only time I brought up my yeah. wife. Yeah. Guillermo said everything. Everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is that a good answer or a bad answer, by the way, as a woman? What would you say? Well, Where I would you? Just, I, I don't know. I mean, she. I'm <laughs> We, you know, I think what Sebastian wanted to do, you know, um, uh, 
for for a man, it, it's you know the the relationship with their, his father is important, and and what he becomes in, in life, and also with the mother, of, of course. But we wanted, um, I think, we wanted to talk about our fathers only because it affected us greatly. And and my dad had a huge effect on me. My mom had a huge effect on me too. But my dad shot me, so it was a little bit of a, a different impact on my life. And and I think that that was the same thing with Sebastian. Sebastian had a a, a you know a tough relationship and Guillermo also had a pretty tough relationship with his father. So I think those things, um, you know, our mothers were much, um, nicer. Yeah. Your mother Sometimes, is always yeah. with you. Uh, for me, my mother is an angel and she was that she died three years, two years before the patrol. And she was always there. So I didn't have to talk about her, you know, microphone really Pardon. enjoyed uh, the movie thank you thank so you. much for doing that but the timing with the last question so I actually had two questions but my first one is what about the role of women in the military in light of your movie in light of the reflections you just talked about what about in the case of America women entering the tip of the spear combat arms infantry and armor starting in 2016 you know what what is the message that you have for the american population and service members that are women that might want to enter the combat arms tip of the spear roles and my second question the only establishment that we saw you ever enter throughout the whole journey was a church why is that uh, I mean, we would go in, you know, we go into diners and have a meal or whatever sometimes. It just wasn't always that interesting. The churches were interesting to me. Um, and, you know, particularly for me as an atheist, like I know I really, well, you saw, I really never, had never been to church. So I was sort of fascinated by them. And uh, um, on to the incredibly complicated question that you, <laughs> your first question. I mean, I, you know, I feel like the Army has figured out how to turn frontline soldiers how to turn young people into sort of ideal frontline soldiers, right? That where their chances of survival are maximized. And I think for women to be in that position, they have to turn into the exact same thing. And so I think anyone has to turn into the exact same thing. And I'm a civilian, right? I had to sort of turn into that. I just didn't have a gun. Um, I think in some ways, if women can Learn, and obviously they can. If they can learn to think and react and act exactly like men in that situation, they'll be fine. Brandon, I just wanted to add something to what the gentleman said over there uh, who made the EOD joke about the t-shirt. Um, I'm a Marine vet, please don't like, I know I'm surrounded by soldiers, so I'll watch what I say. Um, but- uh, You're outnumbered. <laughs> you're not just bridging a gap. You're not just telling your story. Um, you're saving lives. Um, the stuff that you guys went through over there, I can't remember what I did with my Marines because of my TBI. And Marines don't usually get this emotional, I'm sorry. But watching Restrepo and Korangal reminds me of what I lost. And when I want to end it all, that's what I watch. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my fucking heart. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One last question, if there is one. I wonder how we can help, Brendan. Maybe you can answer this question of uh, once you come back, I work for the VA, and what I see, this is my personal experience, is that we want to help, but the veteran says they want help, and they already don't follow through with the action that we can offer. Not, not all veterans, I'm not saying every single veteran, but some isolate themselves, we call them, we want them to come in. We even have programs where we actually go to their house. What can, not the VA, but anybody do to a veteran who's trying to seek assistance or, uh, or even if they're not trying to seek assistance, what can somebody do? Uh, that's a really awesome question. And um, you know, I've given that a lot of thought. There's a lot of things, uh, I think, I think that I'm an alcoholic, you know, um, and I go to AA every single morning because if I don't go to AA, I drink. And alcoholism 
Um, you can't have willpower. It's not willpower. It's not anything that, that saves you from alcoholism. It's talking with other alcoholics on how they got sober. And some kind of something happens inside of AA that keeps me from drinking. I've had it, I have a year. I haven't had a year since I was fucking 12. <laughs> Not even in combat. So something works inside AA. And I think, not comparing alcoholism to veterans, but when you're talking about serving in combat, I think the most important thing is, um, when you come home, is meeting up with other veterans. Other veterans, you know, I'm never gonna get better from alcoholism by seeking a shrink. You know, that's not gonna help me. What's gonna help me is talking with other alcoholics. Same thing with veterans, you know, you're not, veterans aren't gonna have, uh, there's gonna be certain things that you can get from a shrink, but the, the real healing is talking with another veteran and saying, hey, what do you feel about this, you know? And, and getting that honest answer. I think that that is what's gonna save a lot of lives. And VA, need to start setting that up. Away from even, not even a counselor inside that setting. I mean, just letting a veteran run group be a veteran run group, you know. Um, those are really important things. And then there's also things like Outward Bound for Veterans. Outward Bound for Veterans is a, has anyone heard of that? It's, it's an extremely cool organization. And it go, you, you go on a week long trip with other veterans and you get to go sailing, you get to go hiking, you get to dog sled if you want a dog sled. You get to um, uh, whitewater rafting. We went on whitewater rafting, me and 15 of my buddies that I served with. And that was so good for me. And it's completely free for the veteran um, through donations uh, the country gives. So it's like, not only is, like, if you donate to this, you're giving back to veterans. And it's just this really great program. So I think things like that are going to help you know, get veterans home and, and to connect with uh, other veterans. I think that's the, the key. I think that that's what's gonna save lives. It's not gonna be what the VA does, it's gonna be what, what veterans are doing for each other. Um, if I saw, if I saw, when I'm, I don't care if it was a um, person I didn't know, if, if there was a soldier wounded in front of me inside combat, I would go in the middle of firefight and, and try to pull that person out because that's what you do, right? So when, when you have someone inside your community that's a veteran that's having a hard time and you're a veteran, you don't know, reach out. You know, you would be doing it in combat, so what do we, what's the difference here in, in the United States? There's no difference, you know. So I think that, that reaching out is gonna be the key to saving veterans. What, what does that mean though for civilians, right, who are uh, like this gentleman and, and myself and others who are here tonight who want to do something to help and make it better? What role? Can we play? Um, supporting those that, that that stuff I'm talking about. That environment, yeah. where you guys can come together. Because you're not civilians. I mean, as much as you're going to do to help us welcome us home, um, you're not going to help us with the deep trauma. Deep trauma, you're going to talk with other veterans about. You know, uh, I could talk to you uh, all day about how it felt to lose Restrepo, but until I talk to another veteran that has lost his best friend, um, you know what. It's not going to matter. It's going to matter. It's going to be feel great to talk about it, but that understanding is what's key. Understanding and being understood is what's healing about um, with trauma. Which is why the last patrol was yeah. helpful. Yeah, sharing with uh, people who has the same problem. Same problem. Exactly what we have to say. Are you going to do it again? We keep doing it. We keep. We can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> We keep going. We're just out not there. filming it anymore. We're now we just we bring we bring. Uh, yeah, there's no camera and there's no funding, but right, right. Can, no, we can just girls keep going. Come? Yeah, we yeah we brought we brought a woman. Oh, you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have two final. And she brought the soap. She, <laughs> she, finally, we had soap Wait, on a patrol. I had this. I have this one real fu funny thing real fast. We were walking down the. Um, this is the funniest story. We were, <laughs> we were walking down in uh, Wilmington and we're getting into the middle of the city and and this. <laughs> This car pulls up to a, and, and this guy looks out of the window. He's like, hey, what are you guys doing, you know? And he's like, and we're like, oh, we're walking to. Um, he's with his girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, he's with his girlfriend. He's with his girlfriend, and she's driving, and he's in the passenger seat. And he's, we're like, yeah, we're walking to, uh, at that point, we were walking to New York still. I was like, do you want to come? And he didn't have anything. He didn't have a backpack, nothing. And he starts, <laughs> he starts getting out of the car. The girlfriend pulls him back in. <laughs> So it's appealing, I think, to a lot of people. 
I have two final questions. Brendan, you had something, a uh, piece of advice to share with the cadets as they embark on their military careers. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> 20. <laughs> yes, money. That will help. Um, I, you know, there's a few things that my leaders did that were that made them successful. Um, and one of the, the main things with that my lieutenants did that was really successful was that they listened to their sergeants. And I know that that's drilled into cadets and drilled into cadets, but it's so important. So when you go out into your your units, listen to your sergeants. They know what to do. They they will help you. They will they will let, be the ones to let you succeed. <clears throat> and also. The more I see um, the army I, and the military, I, I think it's the more it's becoming political, and it kind of upsets me. And um, sometimes lieutenants and, and leaders sometimes make the decision best for their career rather than for their soldiers. And I think it's very important to realize that true leadership means that you put yourself second. You put everything in your life second to your men or women, and that is what leadership is. So when you're put in a situation where it's hard and you figure, oh, what's, what's the right answer? It's always gonna be the soldiers underneath you or the people underneath you. What is the best thing for them? I wish I could say that to the president. I wish I could say that to every leader in the world because true leadership means putting yourself second. So that's the, the two things I really, really wanted to talk to you about. Thank you. So, as, as sad as it is, um, the reason that the four of us are actually on this stage tonight is because we are united by the death of our friends um, or the trauma of combat and how it's affected us in different ways. And as, as you know, um, I lost a loved one to the war in Afghanistan, which is how I got involved in supporting this community um, when I previously had no ties whatsoever. Um, you lost a friend, you guys deployed together, were embedded together, you were lost a very close friend and then met Sebastian, um, who was so close with Tim, and Sebastian loves you for being the person you are and the person you are, you were with him, um, you must have been in that moment when, when he passed. And so um, it's these silver linings um, become very, very clear and bright to me. Um, that the reason all of us are, are here tonight having this wonderful experience ahead of Veterans Day at Google is, is because of those traumatic and difficult situations. And so I just wanted to close by asking you about Tim Hetherington, your dear friend, and all three of you um, knew him and loved him. Um, the last time I was on this stage with Sebastian was when we screened Restrepo here, and Tim was in one of these chairs right, right here. And um, I wonder what he would say what would he think about about tonight and this conversation, and um, what would he say? Yeah, I think I think about that a lot. You know, I went on to make a film about him and his death and his work, and uh, and then I went back into the Restrepo material, made Korngal, and I had him in in uh, in my mind. You know, he he shot he shot a lot of that footage, obviously, and um, and uh, and then and this film is like. <coughs> The Last Patrol, it happened in the form that it did, uh, partly because he was alive and we were friends and we had ideas together. And one of the ideas that popped up within our professional relationship was this idea. And But it took this form because he died and I was with these other guys. And um, I I just have to, th I have to think that he would be, um, yeah, he'd be he'd be tremendous if he somehow could know right as a, to somehow know that this trip happens as it did and this evening was happening he'd be a little puzzled and uh but i have to think he would be really incredibly affected by it like we're all and we're all affecting all of us with or without our deaths or we're all affecting so many people all the time hopefully in pretty good ways and i uh, I, th there aren't many good things that come from people's deaths. I mean, I, you know, obviously we all know that. But this is, I think, maybe one of the very most powerful things that I've ever seen personally 
come from a tragedy was this experience the four of us had. And uh, it's a weird, you know, you don't even know what to be grateful for, grateful to, but um, it's tremendous, I think. Kiru? Well, I met Tim in Libya. I was not really good friend of him. I, I met him there, like, but uh, we, we, we become, like, tight. I mean, these few days together. And I remember when he died, the rebel leader who was in the house where we were staying, he said, repeat many times, this guy was a gentleman. This guy was a gentleman. And he was a gentleman. He acted like a gentleman. He was a really nice person. You could see him deal with the people. He was a nice guy. I don't know how he will have felt in front of America, but of course he will have made amazing pictures. I know. Because America is a place to get pictures, to get feelings, to get a lot of things out, good and bad. And I made, I, I, when I finished my work of America with pictures, I was really surprised because it's one of my best works in all my, uh, all my career. Even I was in Afghanistan, the, all these crazy places. The work I, I, I can f see more feelings is the one I made here in America. So I'm sure Tim will have done something similar. <clears throat> you know, uh, when I first when I first got home, I had um, <clears throat> I was, like I said, I was I was a really bad place, and I was trying to get sober, and I was trying to get help. And um, Tim uh, offered up his place for me in um, in Brooklyn, and uh, he said, "The one thing that I want you to do is not to drink." And uh, within a week, I was drunk, and I realized at that moment that. I really cared for Tim, and I couldn't even hold that promise up to Tim. And it, it was like the first signs that, to me, other than my whole entire life falling apart, that, that I had a serious alcohol problem. And um, I don't know how he would feel about the film, but I know he would look at me and say, right on, man, you got a year, awesome. And I think that you'd be very proud of, uh, of us for doing what we did, um, yeah. Thank you for sharing about your friend. Um, this is wonderful. I, uh, I've said it to you a hundred times, but I'm so grateful to you. We're all so grateful to you for the work that you're doing to, to help us get these stories out as well and um, for the healing that it's, it's given to all of us who are touched by any trauma that we've been through. Um, whether you've gone to war or otherwise, uh, being able to talk about it and share it with other people and the, the example that you all are setting by doing that. Um, is a true form of leadership, and uh, we're very, very grateful to all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. All of you, we wish you a happy early Veterans Day. Please come back and visit us Google at any time. Um, we love you guys. We love you gals, and uh, we're here to help whether we served or not. There's a whole bunch of us who have and a whole bunch who haven't, but uh, we're figuring it out together, and um, you're welcome here anytime. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.